Welcome to episode 26 on the journey to conscious healthcare. This is series two, episode five, and it's called From Burnout to Longevity. What drives allied health professionals and what does the future hold? In this podcast, we explore what it takes to consciously create longevity, happiness, and fulfillment in your life and that of others. The journey to conscious healthcare looks at the healthcare industry, disability sector, and how to best navigate these areas to get the best for you and your life. I'm your host, Trevor Keane, and I'm also the founder and CEO of Conscious Healthcare SA, an expert company that is known for high quality healthcare services and transforming the healthcare industry in the disability space. Today's show is sponsored by Conscious Healthcare SA. Conscious Healthcare SA is now employing. That's right, we're creating ripples and making available more dream roles for practitioners to fulfill on what it is that they do best. If you're interested in exploring an allied health career where you genuinely get to explore patient-centered practice, please do get in touch. Further details around this will be in the show notes. Today's guest is Catherine Anir and is a registered developmental educator, a lecturer, and clinical practitioner at Flinders University and has served on the local and national not-for-profit boards for over 20 years. Currently is the founder of A Different Mind, chairperson of the DEAI, a director at Autism CRC. Catherine is also a founding member of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network of Australia and New Zealand and has spent over 15 years in the autism advocacy space in both grassroots and high-level policy setting, as we'll hear about more shortly. Catherine also sits on the ministerially appointed Autism Advisory Group for the National Disability Insurance Agency, NDIA, and the Children, Young People and Families Reference Group for the NDIA Independent Advisory Council. Catherine brings lived experience as an autistic person who has also, who also has numerous autistic family members. This is complemented by almost 20 years as a practicing developmental educator, working predominantly with autistic individuals who have complex support needs and also their families. Catherine is a passionate advocate for co-design in research and public policy and the translation of research and policy into meaningful practice for disabled people with a particular emphasis on the most marginalized people. What an introduction that is, uh, Catherine. You've certainly achieved many things and welcome for joining us here today. Thanks very much. We might jump straight in. We have got a personal question to start and yours that you chose was in regards to a quirky, strange habit or hobby. Would you like to please tell me more? Okay. I think I'll just talk about two of the collections I have. Um, one mm-hmm. is View Masters. So if people aren't familiar with them, they probably know the red plastic one and you put the card in and then you click and you get 3D images. I've got a mm-hmm. collection of those that starts off in the early 20th century, so with the Bakelite models and then right through to the modern day. I think probably my um, most favourite model is the Model E, which is kind of a very Art Deco kind of top, angular top that's made of Bakelite. And then my second collection would be of um uh, moral education texts from the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, so they're books like What a Young Woman Ought to Know, What a Young Man Ought to Know, What a Young Husband Ought to Know, What a Young Wife Ought to Know, etc. cetera. Um, and they're very highly moralistic texts that include a lot of, I guess, eugenic literature as well, and I just find mm. them uh, fascinating to compare, you know, where we were to where we've come from. Um, and also perhaps that we're not as far away from that whole scenario as we thought we might be by now, 100 years later, there's still a lot of that sort of undercurrent of Mm. ideas about who is uh, a worthy kind of human. So I think it's important to reflect back, but also there's some quite uh, hilarious things in there as well about ideas about how things are and should be around people's bodies and the like so yeah well very fascinating 
couple interesting, uh, quirky sort of things that you're interested in, particularly what uh, sparks an interest for me is I think small talk's not big on your agenda. I think you like big thoughts, ideas, and concepts. Uh, that's that's certainly something yeah. that's come through yeah. very clear in regards to your extensive knowledge. And we're just talking prior in regards to how you're just a walking book. Uh, well, that's what I sort of see. So whilst we're jumping straight into questions, I might jump in and get you to answer for those who are unaware, what is a developmental educator? Oh, well, that's a question that um, I think we're having to continuously ask. Uh, sorry, mm. continuously answer for people what is a developmental educator. A developmental educator is an allied health professional who combines um, the use of discrete tools, so assessments and approaches to helping people with disability reach their goals with a philosophical overview of um, critical disability studies and human rights centered practice. So we look at the sociological place of people with disability in society as well as the human rights of people with disability through the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disability and other intersecting conventions, as well as taking a very proactive social justice role around systemic change for people with disability. So we not only work with individuals, but we work with the systems around them so that we are creating a better society for disabled people to live in. So um, because a lot of the change that needs to occur is not in the individual, but mm. in fact, in their environment and the society in which they operate so that we can, you know, always work on individual skill building, but oftentimes we'll assess a situation and realise that it's not the person that needs to change, it's their environment or the people around them or the people's expectations have to change, mm. become more inclusive um, and and more acknowledging of of the diversity of the spectrum and that is humanity rather than expecting everybody to sort of slot in neatly into, um, you know, the very kind of rigid systems that we've built. Um, so DEs work simultaneously with people setting goals employing methodologies as well as working on that systemic change with a very big focus on social justice yeah yeah massive and i think uh, what's rang really true out of that is hey one somewhat purposeful uh, career path i think i think a very mm. purposeful full career path and secondly uh, i think something that we discussed a little bit before was about if you blend a social worker and an ot there's quite a lot of overlap but particularly the foundational framework and the overarching principles was the big sort of difference is that fair to say yeah look i mean we we would employ some of i guess the same methodologies and technologies as social workers and ot's but principally we're concerned with um access inclusion mm. uh, and justice and equity for people with disability so we don't work with other populations we work primarily with people with disabilities and their families and their supportive networks so and and we're very proactive about those uh you know pillars of justice mm. equity access and inclusion no oh, fantastic that's very very clear for you which is great and that segues great into the next question which has us go through, let's talk about the very unique perspective that developmental educators have, particularly around the history. I don't think people uh, or many people might understand in regards to how developmental educators come because it's a very rich history as to how you came to be. Yeah, I think we, we're we predominantly at, at this time a South Australian profession, although we have Men, we have members from all over Australia and we have growing groups of people practising in Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. Um, but at the University at Flinders, there was seen a need to become more progressive and move beyond what was then uh, mental deficiency nursing, so nurses who worked with people with um developmental disability and uh, mental health issues and special education, which was 
you know, a very sort of segregated practice. So how do we join the sort of medical model and the educational practices Mm -hmm. and evolve them into something that looks more like the social model of disability whilst Mm. retaining that sort of clinical aspect. So becoming allied health practitioners with, you know, uh, clinical tools and tasks but really wrapping around that social model of disability and the sociological place of disabled people in the world so that we could progress and move beyond the medical model and the segregated models of special education Mm. and institutional living. Absolutely. I think putting that really in a nutshell, and correct me if I get any of this wrong, really important to note how we did have those nurses that were working. Then we also had special education that was happening. There's a lot of like blurred sort of boundaries and there there wasn't like a really clear path. So Flinders has then stepped in and developmental education Mm. was born, which fundamentally works specifically with people with disabilities. So it's very niche, right? I mean, if you you don't go to the class. Yeah, and yeah. across the lifespan as well. So it wasn't Absolutely. just about it wasn't just about meeting the needs of children and young people. It was about meeting mm. the needs of people who uh, were perhaps initially those nurses may have had contact with people, a lot of contact with people in institutional living, mm. and um, you know, back in the eighties, that you know the quality of life of people living in institutions was particularly poor. It still is now, but it was particularly mm. poor and there were more people in institutional living. And and um, so life expectancy was very reduced, health care access mm. was problematic, and just the idea of somebody actually meeting, you know, setting and meeting some personal goals beyond sort of the, uh, captivity of institutional living and routine was was novel back then. Mm. It was like, how do we help people set goals, learn skills that enable them to move beyond the boundaries of those segregated settings and move into truly sort of interdependent relationships in the community um, and seeing people as part of the fabric of community rather than mm. people in other places like that whole special people in special places was, you know, mm. is something that's led to, I guess, a lot of tragedy over time because people yeah. always think that those, you know, disabled people are being looked after over there so we don't need to worry about that problem. Um, mm. Whereas I think there was a core group of people that thought that um, there was a need to, you know, address individual skill building um and re- and realize i guess the capacity of people for lifelong learning so that it's not just you finish school and then you're stuck in sort of this environment that's not stimulating has no purpose um but everybody has the capacity to learn across the lifespan and that was really really important and how what, what sort of specific learning technologies um could we employ to um, help people gain skills but also simultaneously how can we educate the community about the responsibility to Mm. include disabled people oh fantastic i think that is very fascinating to to get because it's such a niche uh, area and obviously a growing area as well. We know that the NDIS is booming massively and it should. And we know Bill Shorten's on the case as uh, many other mm. ministers are, are working through to try and make a better education sector, disability sector, and fundamentally just very inclusive for people. Uh, I find uh, developmental education is very fascinating across the lifespan. And, and what I mean by that is we might go for a normal, uh, dare I say normal, I don't think anything is normal, right? But like say, for example, if you're a child and then you end up going through to high school, you then have changes of friendships and all that sort of stuff, and then you become an adult, get work, all that sort of stuff, you've got life stages that change. And mm-hmm. typically speaking, uh, you might have social workers that, you know, they work across all different la- uh, stages of life and it doesn't matter whether you have a disability or whether you, you do or don't have a disability, essentially. 
Uh, and then, you know, you might then have a midlife crisis, whatever else it might be, but having someone who is tailored, right? You don't get a, a pilot to then do the mechanical work on your mm. car, right? So this is very much in the disability sector, specialized across the life stages with a mindset of growth and development. Empowerment is what I'm really hearing. Uh, yeah. So I'm kind of curious, can you run me through, like practically, what does a developmental educator do and how, how you, maybe we'll use some examples about how that ends up really in the real world as that positively impacting people's lives? Sure. Look, the the, the role is really, really diverse um, mm. and I think that's probably a strength, but when, when it comes to communicating the role, it makes it a little bit more complex. So in the early childhood space, we may look at doing a range of developmental assessments and look at specific skill building for the individual but we would also so, look at so global development delay so i just want to make this yeah, really clear for the yeah. audience then we'll keep unpacking look, it as we, we would work yeah. with uh we have um knowledge and training around a range of impairment types so it's not just mm-hmm. developmental disability um yep. but we would work with that um child to uh, sort of assess their developmental level, bring about mm-hmm. skills change, possibly through things like structured teaching mm-hmm. or um, play or addressing sensory needs, mm-hmm. a range of things that we bring together to do that. But the other important part, simultaneously, we would be working with the family to increase yeah. their knowledge of their child so that they have an increased capacity to to adjust to having a child with disability mm. and to understand the worldview of their child so that they can, you know, create shared meaning with their child. I think that's the most important yeah. thing is that people get an opportunity to create shared meaning so that they don't feel like they're in two separate worlds that they can join together and and that the parents can understand the child's perspective and, you know, if there are developmental issues, you know, what's next for that child and how can we encourage them to develop in their own unique way um, with people that are in tune with them rather than that sort of mismatch of uh, of re- relational style. It's actually bringing the, it, working relationally and bringing people together mm. With a with an understanding, yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm hearing. I, I might be hearing this wrong. Uh, there's a Montessori approach in regards to learning. Is there sort of an element of that coming in here? I don't know if it's related or not. Um, and what I, I suppose I really mean here is. Uh, what came out of that for me is, you know, if we talk about global development delay, for example, often you might have a physiotherapist or an occupational therapist that's involved in that space doing some very, you know, physical related movements. Mm. But then we've just talked about sensory as well, right? So we've got sensory issues often uh, that could be done by, say, a, a DE, that could be done by a social worker um, or an occupational therapist typically. So we've got multiple spheres happening with the one uh, child here. I'm kind yeah. of curious as to how do we best unpack what's in and what's not? Or is there a lot of blurred boundaries between different roles? Because uh, you said working families as well. Yeah, look, um, it's important to note that we work in um, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary teams. So we're not going to do it all. And where mm. the scope of our practice ends, we would refer on to an occupational therapist, a physiotherapist, a speech and language pathologist, for their input and expertise in mm. that particular area. So for us, it's 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 a role of um, being that kind of person that builds knowledge as well because of the attunement to disability in particular and the ways in which people with disability are affected in society in general, we take on that educational role of um, skill building of the person's network as well as the individual so that they have that perspective on on disability and how they might expect things to progress and also how they might access the systems that they Mm. need in order to get the support that they need. So I guess one of the other things we tend to do is go into those support coordination roles, particularly Mm. the complex 
um, area of support coordination, the specialist support coordination, just because we have that systems wide view of things. But we might also work with someone, say, on a retirement plan, if it's a person with intellectual disability who might be mm. exiting an, um, you know, Australian disability enterprise, we know that not a lot of energy goes into retirement mm. plans for those people. They don't have any super um, and they don't have any savings in particular generally. And then w- what we see is after retirement, a decline in health and well-being because they're not engaged in what they were doing daily and quite often that environment meant that all of their friends were at their workplace so they we just see this drop off in health and well-being and connectedness so retirement mm-hmm. planning is really important important yeah. in terms of looking that person in, within their system and saying well all of these previously available opportunities will be closing off so how do we create new opportunities for this person so they don't experience that decline in health and well-being and that subsequent isolation so that's kind of like you know bookending the lifespan and then what does it mean Mm. to um what does it mean to face the end of life with disability and and a Mm. few DEs are going into that sort of end of life planning and that not necessarily just for people who are aging or elderly somebody might have a degenerative condition and need to face end of life decisions um and it's about assisting people not to be in a holding pattern waiting to die but actually to enjoy um their life while they're living and i think Mm. unfortunately there are some assumptions around you know global assumptions about the quality of life of people with disability and that it is less and often not valued as a as a thing. So when it comes into interactions with healthcare, there's often a lot of um, assumptions about people's quality of life, which affects the delivery of of yeah. healthcare. So it's about actually fulfilling those, you know, needs to create meaning in people's lives, whatever stage of life they're at, is getting mm. the most out of your life, getting the most connection, getting the most meaning. And developing individual skills that enable you to do, you know, practical things. Uh, so, for example, transport training, getting out and learning how to use public transport with a view of not just it being a task to be done, but it yeah. creates a whole new world for a person if they become oh, absolutely more um, sort of successful at using public transport then they're able to get out into the community more so Mm. it's all it's about having a focus of you know using public transport is not necessarily the end goal because you've got to actually be going planning to go somewhere when you're Mm. using public transport so (laughs) not just for the sake of like catching a bus but where's the bus going and thinking about okay well what opportunities is this going to open up because it's great to learn to catch the bus from say your supported accommodation to your you know ade but what other opportunities could bus travel open up in Mm. terms of you know being able to catch a bus we're in adelaide catch a bus to the adelaide hills and enjoy something Mm. out in the community or being able to just catch the bus for enjoyment some people just like catching public transport so further that as well i mean if you think about it where to then if you get there or let's say it's to Mm. go somewhere have you got the social skills to then interact have you got to consider any sensory issues or other what what other things in the environment you also need to consider to make sure that's a good experience right yes so it's about building success as well so it's about developing and enhancing people's opportunities for successful um experiences so Mm. that the you know we're not setting people up for failure so that they're not then becoming closed off because they've had a a a negative experience with something Mm. because they might have been pushed into that thing because maybe it wasn't their goal or maybe you know they didn't have that the underlying um skill and learning to make that success so it's sort of Mm. looking at um working collaboratively and thinking well what what individual skills does this person need to make this Mm. successful but also what changes are in the environment or people around them are necessary 
to make this a successful experience. So it's it's success building success rather than mm. having to constantly face failure and barriers. Yeah, I totally hear that. I think a couple uh, interesting things out of that. One, uh, to start with, Carol McKinstry, the OTA uh, president, I interviewed her recently and it was very uh, fascinating and fruitful to discuss, particularly about the OTs, the jack of all trades. And I'm hearing there's a lot of overlap between social workers, developmental educators, even physiotherapists, um, I think of, and developmental educators. I'm sure I've missed someone in there, but like, as in, there's a lot of overlap. But I also am hearing a real theme of a movement towards this whole interdisciplinary practice. It's been talked about for a while, but I don't think really it's hitting the ground running. And I think there's huge value in that in some, and appreciating that, hey, just because we can swim in two or three different lanes in this instance with this person, I'm swimming here. And that's where I'm really best suited. And yeah. I, I use the example. In fact, I spoke quite a lot on that podcast with Carol McKinstry about, hey, we've got a lot of uh, children that we've got autism, sensory issues. Issues. We've got so much hidden capacity within developmental educators and social workers, but everyone wants an occupational therapist, an OT. What's happening? Like, as in, how are we addressing this? How are we educating other support coordinators and fundamentally giving people access to all these services that they need? I mean, that sitting on a wait list for six or 12 months helps no one, right? Mm. I, I don't think, I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted here. Yeah. But what, what can we then do to educate other people, support coordinators? It doesn't matter who exactly, but fundamentally, it's really important, I think, for us to educate that, hey, multiple people can play in the same lane and also there might be differences. There's same and different, so value can be offered yeah. by all people. Well, I think this is a great <laughs> vehicle, this podcast, to get the word out there about, um, you know, working into interdisciplinary teams and working to our strengths and acknowledging mm. that each profession has employs specific technologies that are valuable to people with disability um, mm. and that we should all be working in that shared space um, and, and and all yeah, letting support coordinators know of, you know, all of the professions. But I think a key piece of information is that uh, for the NDIA in that we're, we're not, if you see a DE and an OT, you're not doubling up because you've got specific um areas of practice that you offer Mm. um and and work well together so therefore you're not doubling up by having a de and an ot because an ot is working on on (laughs) on you know the occupational model and we're working with this developmental social justice model and we of course we overlap and we complement each other but we're focusing on um what, what, what DEs bring to the table is that idea of, you know, how that person is situated in society from a disability perspective. Mm. Um, OTs also focus on the person's environment and the biopsychosocial and the international classification of functioning. Um, so they use those tools. We use those tools with a social and disability justice lens. So. Uh, we complement each other. We're not in competition with each other. Um, what we bring is that social and disability justice lens. What they bring are some other technical mm. skills that we don't have and we don't claim to have and we don't train in. So we mm. we don't do a lot of the functional uh, assessments around, say, uh, moving or for moving from place to place or your body in space and all of those mm. sorts of things. And we don't do activities of daily living assessments. We might do like uh, more of the sort of ABAS or, or Vineland, mm-hmm. which is more yeah. of a global tool, but we don't follow somebody around and, and see how they sit and stand and move in their space. And we don't have that functional occupational lens that OTs Mm. bring uh, in terms of how to functionally get somebody. And we certainly don't do all those physical therapeutic Mm. activities that physios do. Well, that's a very fascinating one because that's actually where I was going to go to shortly, particularly around 
the way I looked at it, and many also see it this way as well, is if you blended a social worker and a physio together, uh, then you can sort of get an OT, sort of, right? Uh, and then also if you had a developmental educator, and if they don't necessarily cross off on uh, the, the physical aspects, maybe you blended a developmental educator and a physio together, you're getting closer to an OT. I suppose the goal that I'm really getting towards here is People are waiting for functional capacity evaluations, assessments, mm. and fundamentally, whilst you're waiting, your life is still existing, right? Now, the quality of yep. your life isn't improving. So my point being, how can we start having this universally adopted across the board from the NDIA that they start actually embracing this cross-collaboration? Because ultimately, if we haven't got capacity in one space, a good example here, case in point, mental health Social workers can often do quite a lot of work in regards to the counselling space that, you know, psychology doesn't have the capacity for. It's Mm. proven that they don't have the capacity for it. So how can we now create more capacity for functional capacity evaluations? I think this is a a great topic. I don't know if there's more scope potentially for developmental educators or I'd particularly like to know your view on the topic. Oh, look, I think from our perspective, um, it's very important to note that those tools are licensed so and and that you need to have a certain level of um, accreditation with, say, Pearson to deliver certain mm-hmm. tools, and not all developmental educators. So those who are maybe earlier de- graduates of some of the earlier iterations of the degree mm-hmm. meet the requirements for level B practice. Right, new graduates do, um, and older graduates can sit a course with Pearson. Um, in order to become a level B so practitioner. We, yeah, can we unpack that? So are you telling yeah. me that someone who's done the level B, I know I'm level B as a, a yeah. master of physiotherapy, so are you saying that they might be able to do some of these assessments in regards to functional or is there yes. just trying to work out if there's a difference? Can you Because this is an expansion of scope or yeah. is this in normal scope? Uh, this is within our normal scope of practice. It's yep. just that there are particular requirements of Pearson's to have undergone um, education in, um, you know, statistical analysis mm. and fidelity and, and you know, looking at that real um, assessment practice in terms mm. of the psychometrics of assessments and how to conduct assessments with high fidelity. So, um, and many DEs have gone on to do that training or they have trained in other professions and have that skill. Um, but functional capacity assessment has been part of our practice for a very long time, but not particularly in using those uh, psychometric tools, but more in the behaviour space of looking at uh, ecological analysis and, and the assessment assessment of function of behaviour mm. in a global context. What what right. DEs particularly bring to positive behaviour support is that whole sociological and contextual mm. position of the person with disability. Yeah. So the first thing we'll be doing is not necessarily looking at the person's behaviour. We're looking at their context, their environment, yeah. their relationships. And then if we have to work on behaviour change with the individual, then that becomes part of the plan. But oftentimes a lot of the goals are not for the individual. They're for mm. things to change around them. So, for example, yeah. if if there is a, a person who has a speech device prescribed by a speech pathologist and the behavioural goal is for the person to use that device to make requests, then there are a whole lot of other things that are contingent and, mm. and that is for support workers to have the device charged if it's an iPad, have it available, present it to the person, Mm. understand the function of the communication device. Um, So the goals might not be, the goal might be for that person to reliably request something 70% of the time. But if the iPad is not Mm. available, it's not charged, it's sitting in an office desk or something and the people don't see the value of having a communication device Mm. or they, in fact, assume that they just know what the person's saying anyway, then it's a whole lot of goals for those people and not for the individual because in order for the individual to, to, you know, develop that um, capacity, 
reliably, then a whole lot of environmental stuff has to change. Um, yeah. And that's really important to consider in a, in that whole of the global context. And, yeah. and, and then you bring the rights of people with disability into that. And it is the person's right to have their communication device available to them when they need to use it. Mm. Therefore, people need to be educated around you know, this is a fundamental human right to be able to communicate by your preferred means um, and have communication uh, access available to you is a human right. Therefore, people over here need to understand that it is their job. It's not optional for them to yeah. charge the iPad and make it available to the person and then be receptive to their communicative intent. Yeah. No, I totally hear that. Uh, I might grab a yes or no. So functional capacity Mm -hmm. assessments, is there capacity to blend different therapies, you believe, to be able to increase uh, the ability for people to be seen sooner? Yes, I think that um, I think probably we need to do a bit of a system-wide analysis of who is able to undertake um, those functional capacity assessments, and that needs to be presented to the NDIA because they have a mm. preference for occupational therapists. Yeah, um, that's, that's interesting. It's a very interesting. I certainly want to have a chat, a further chat with Aaron Byrne. Aaron Byrne, mm. you know very well. He's a DE in the NDIA. But it particularly, I think, if we go one step further, obviously we've got Bill Shorten, who's in charge of, mm. of the NDIS. Uh, mm. And I think that's really important for us to understand who can do these assessments. And if we need to increase capacity, hey, if it's already sitting there, why not use it? Yeah. Yes, yeah. be and responsible think, about it. Yes, let's, let's and I think the, the the key message would be that if a person is um, accredited with Pearson's or whatever ever Acer or whatever mm-hmm. ever, um, uh, I'm not sure of the word, but people who organisation, yeah, yeah, those um, people who sort of uh, uh, own and monitor the assessments. Mm. And if they are level B accredited and have had the appropriate training in that assessment, then that is a valid assessment. Yeah. So I think it uh, understanding matter. or a badge or something helps, wouldn't it? Something like that. To mm. literally have a recognition of that because, hey, otherwise, if everyone who's a planner that's then uh, seeing all these come through, if I'm sitting mm. there and I'm a planner and it doesn't say mm. OT on there, if I'm not listening to it, well, that's not very useful. <laughs> yeah, no. And that and that is, the, I guess, some of the stuff we come up against, particularly mm. if it gets to the pointy end of the wedge, like in the AAT, they want something from an occupational therapist mm. because occupational therapy has become sort of like the niche area and then they might also bring in their own OT to do an assessment and then, Mm. you know, there's kind of like that's the gold standard whereas, in fact, the the standard should be based on who is, who is, you know, registered to deliver those assessments and and the people that, you know, administer the systems around those assessments do not let anybody in, you know, um, that isn't meeting their minimum standards for accreditation. So if you have the accreditation and then you have the specific training and how to deliver the ABAS or the Vineland, mm. then you should that should be accepted as 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 valid. Um, mm. And for example, the HUDAS, anyone can do the HUDAS training. Mm. You don't yeah. need to be. Ideally, you would be from an allied health profession but you don't need to be and what that's that's how they've sort of um you know run out that pared down version (laughs) of the who does for lacs and planners and all of that sort of thing but ideally you would want somebody who is familiar with capacity assessments and familiar with that icf biopsychosocial framework to be Mm. delivering the HUDES or looking at the icf categories rather than an lac or a planner who's done you know, I don't know. Well, might might not have training, training equally exactly, and I think equally you, you and I would probably both agree that the way you ask a question, particularly for someone that might have an intellectual disability, for mm. example, not just that, uh, but that can also gear the answer a particular way. And we do get taught that at uni when we go to uni. We certainly understand that the way we ask a question, whether it's open or closed, we can force mm. an answer a yeah. particular way. Uh, what I yeah. might jump onto is positive behaviour store, uh, positive behaviour support. 
taking mm-hmm. the world by short. So it's uh, by storm. It's PBS for short. Uh, where do you think DEs fit within this? Because I think you've said a lot about this already today, but it's not specifically. We haven't specifically well, discussed it. Um, a large part of the training that DEs undertake, particularly at Flinders, but also across other uh, universities where people then become accredited with us, is is that um, behavioural approach that underpins um, PBS. Um, mm-hmm. But I think the important thing that DEs bring is that rights and justice lens. Mm. So it's not about behaviour change for the sake of behaviour change or behaviour change to make uh-huh. it easier for other people. So yeah. it's not coming in and saying you need to change your behaviour to to be more like other people or you need to change your mm-hmm. behaviour because your behaviour is difficult and everybody else is finding it hard. It's actually looking at globally what are this person's individual rights, yeah. um, what needs to change around them to uphold their rights and then what plan comes out of that and what are the goals mm. for the individual in terms of shaping or supporting them to become more functional, say, in their communication mm. or self-regulation, coupled with what are the goals for everybody else? What should everybody yeah. else be doing to support that person? Um, because sometimes it's an environmental issue related to sensory or or overload or um, some of the things that occur around people's expectations of other people. And the other side of things is that sometimes it's medical. And Mm. so we need to be looking into, you know, is the person having medication side effects? Are they experiencing pain or distress? All of those sort of things need to be considered and that's why it's really important to employ those tools and develop it. If you're developing a hypothesis about behaviour, you don't do it from looking at a case file or meeting the person Mm. once. You sit down with them, you talk to their family, you talk to their support workers, you talk to other allied health professionals, you shadow them in their environment, you follow them into the community and work out what globally is going on for this person and how their behaviour fits within the whole bigger picture and whether, in fact, we can make all of these environmental adjustments and change people's expectations and also educate people about the communicative function of behaviour or Mm. the function of behaviour in terms of self-regulation so that they can see that this behaviour that the person that they find challenging is actually, say, a form of communication or self-regulation. Mm. And if it's not currently working or operating as functional communication, then how can we work on actually having people around them see that this is communicative intent and attending mm. to people's communicative intent yeah. rather than saying that's a really annoying behaviour or that's yeah. a really challenging behaviour? Because a lot of stuff that... A lot of scenarios I walk into with very people with very, very complex needs is that people are bored and they're not mm. engaged and workers don't have the skill to um, engage a person in, you know, reciprocal exchange. They don't have the yeah. capacity to create shared meaning and mm. and the ability to join and, and work alongside a person and see the world from their point of view and discover the things that they're discovering. Mm. Um, so then we have this sort of mismatch between one world and another world and this person over here has needs to the point where they're reliant on other people a lot of the time and if those other people are not in tune with that person, then that this person over here is going to have a very poor quality of life because there's no attunement to their needs, to their communicative intent, to the function of their behaviour. Um, and so they get become part of a, you know, ever-decreasing, smaller kind of environment that mm. becomes more and more restrictive because people can't see things from their point of view. Um, yeah. I'm hearing a lot there. One thing that really comes to mind is about princess chairs. Now, I don't know if you know much about princess chairs, but in a physiotherapy sense, essentially what that was is very convenient to 
be able to be in an aged care facility, put someone in a princess chair, which is a chair where they essentially live their life in that chair. Mm -hmm. They don't get out of it very often. They have a tray table across the front. And that was built fundamentally for it to be easier for a support worker to just wheel someone out and to reduce costs. There was no Mm -hmm. consideration about quality of life and considerations of that individual's person need. And I think what you've said there is 100% a mic drop in particular around, hey, what are we actually trying to achieve? Let's look at the big picture because we can we can get someone to eat or whatever else it is, but like what are we actually, you know, are we thinking about what type of foods that they want to eat? All these different types of things. You're st- stimulating yeah. very thoughtful and fruitful conversation, I believe. I'm very interested. So your background in regards to autism, Josephine Barbaro, I know that you know her and she's got the uh, world's most effective early diagnosis uh, autism tool. How do you think the early diagnosis will help with children into the future and also about how their parents might well cope? Earlier well, access, I think it's not necessarily diagnosis, it's early detections. And yeah. the, what, what, the way I like to frame it is looking for early signs of mm. a, a different developmental trajectory. So yeah. the benefit of that um, is that you can start noticing a, a neurodivergent child and start responding to their ways of creating meaning and understand that they're going to have a different social, communicative and behavioural way of interacting with the world. And that Mm -hmm. kind of, if we, and there's another, um, I think you will note there was an intervention that came out um, through Andrew Whitehouse and colleagues that was talking about early developmental um, intervention by teaching parents how to attune with their child's communicative intent Mm. and their social relational style. Um, So all of these things aren't necessarily about making children that are not neurodivergent anymore. They're actually about making a much safer developmental trajectory because if people are not in tune with you and your developmental and social communicative Mm. style, then you're going to experience more developmental trauma and barrier. So early Noticing early signs and developing early attunement means that we're um, giving parents the capacity to key in to where their children are at and, and, and improve that relational style, which decreases developmental trauma because mm. a lot of the young people I work with who are autistic uh, have in fact experience a high degree of developmental trauma because their Mm. communicative attempts haven't been noticed or their relational style is at odds with their family or their educational setting. Mm. People aren't tuned into them, so they're constantly butting up against barriers and inhospitable environments, which creates a lot more trauma. So if we're if we become more in t- attuned to that sort of social relational style, then then we're creating a more uh, developmentally safe environment for individuals. So it's is you know we could say oh well you know we just have all these detection. Is it about you know just then finding the opportunities to direct people into being neurotypical or more more neurotypical appearing or, you know. Mm. So I think there's been a fundamental shift in the understanding of um, the way we work with autistic people and the I've been involved in the new diagnostic, not sorry, I have to say the new guidelines for early developmental supports mm. um, to increase opportunities for autistic young people and their families through the Autism CRC And at the core of that are 17 um, principles of practice, wholly centred on human rights and Mm. the ability to be a child and being culturally responsive and neurodiversity affirming. And I think that's really, really important that we can help people develop into human beings that are social, relational human beings with the capacity to, to grow and learn but we, there's the double empathy problem in that neurotypical people have to achieve empathy for the autistic persons. It's not, they always talk mm. about, they used to talk about um, problems with reciprocal communication. In reciprocal communication, there are two communication partners and it's yeah, responsibility yeah, yeah. of particularly that 
person with more power, the adult, to mm. understand that they need to empathise with the autistic person as well. So it's yeah, it's about creating shared meaning, really. Um, and if we don't have the capacity to create shared meaning because we don't know that the child is showing early signs, mm. then we're sort of setting off on a trajectory where they're going to bump into more traumatic events, if that if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it rings true in regards to a whole lot of things around co-regulation as well, oh, which absolutely. Jackie Hall spoke yeah. about on in the previous episode that we had, which was mm. from the Parental Stress Centre. And there's so many great principles that I think fundamentally come out. I think what's mm. really exciting actually into the future is we've got Bill Shorten uh, that's coming on. We're doing a, mm. a future podcast with Bill Shorten. We've got Josephine Babaro coming on as well, uh, lining up Peter Malinowskis and also spoken to Blair Boyer, uh, particularly around a topic where we believe that there's a bit of a gap, right? So there's a gap particularly around NDIS and education and people slipping through. I don't know if yeah. you've experienced much of this and, and if you've got any immediate thoughts on that, because I know it's Look, something think- that we really need to make sure we've got some form of a net there, right? It doesn't matter whether it's your problem or my problem. Hey, we're yes. all people. Let's help people yeah. out. And I think this is a systemic issue and that we get a mm. lot of what we call compartmentalization. So it's health, disability, education, and then there are massive silos and then people are falling into the gaps. Um, yeah. A lot of uh, you know, people are uh, sort of reverting to homeschooling as a strategy um, mm. and then there aren't clear boundaries between what is education and what is NDIS and there's not even the conversation is should there be clear boundaries or should there be crossover, should there mm. be a shared responsibility in the middle? But also I think that, you know, from an education perspective, I know that the state government has introduced their assistant minister for autism and will Emily correct Emily Emily Burke Burke sorry yeah Emily Burke yeah so she'll she's the assistant minister for autism but her role is essentially to facilitate the conversation around and bring in people with lived experience parents and autistic people Mm. and educators and policy makers to come together and and make sure that the the problem is collaborative collaboratively defined and that the solution is collaboratively worked on otherwise you're not going to have a good outcome but I think that the importance is in introducing these autism teachers in primary schools is that it's understood that they're they're not there to teach autistic students because that would just be a segregated approach if Mm. a teacher went in and said I'm going to take all the autistic students over here and teach them it's about developing going back (laughs) Well, and and that's not the intention. The intention Mm. is that the person is a key um, knowledge holder and that they they then facilitate cultural um, change and disseminate information Mm. and and direct teachers to to resources and platforms where they can learn more about uh, educating students who are neurodivergent rather than, you know, having this sort of like all special things for special people over here. It's like mm. a whole of school approach, a cultural change is necessary to integrate and truly include students in a school. And I know that there's a lot of other time pressures and, mm. and monetary sort of pressures when it comes to that, but a lot of the things that um are needed, uh, don't cost money. They're about mm. attitudinal change and skill yeah. building that doesn't necessarily um, cost money. There's a great website called Inclusion Ed. I have to say that mm. it's put out by the Autism CRC and I'm on the board of the Autism CRC, but it's a fantastic um, piece of uh, uh, work that's been done where teachers can just visit and look at a whole range of uh, technologies to work with students, a whole range of research that's been um, put forward over the years um, and, and conducted by the CRC in order to bring about, you know, what it, the technologies and the approaches that are best for uh, inclusion, not just mm. for autistic students but for students with disability in general. And they can, people can go on that site and register for free and access all the uh, the materials and webinars and things, and they can have their own profile and discuss with mm. other teachers. So it's a really important tool. And then we also have Positive Partnerships, which is a run by Aspect in New South Wales, which is a federal government education program for parents and teachers and whole schools around 
particularly around autistic students. So there's a lot out there already. So yeah. we don't want to repeat yeah, or come up with, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. We want to be able to gather together the best practice that's out there and mm. put it into school so that there is a cultural change. Yeah. And then the other piece is about what about the rest of people's lives? How do we yeah. build in lifelong opportunity for autistic people and how do we change societal attitudes because I think one of the biggest issues around autism still is stigma um, mm. and I think pe- we've had enough awareness sort of thing mm. but I don't think that awareness has, has led to real attitudinal change because there's still a lot of stigma around autism and autistic people in the community so I think there has to be a big piece of work on addressing the stigma of autism um, yeah. And actually working with people from, you know, a human perspective of, you know, we're all human beings who share many, many of the same traits. We just have a different social relational style. And, in Mm. fact, if you took the time to tune into that social relational style and understand some of the functional communication difficulties, the, the ability to develop rich relationships and benefit from those relationships is there. It's just mm. who's going to take that step. I think autistic people have been taking steps into the neurotypical world for years and years. I think it's the job of society to come and step a little bit our way so that, mm. that we can meet in the middle and come to a better understanding of of, of a way forward so that, we can move forward. And that is not just for people like myself who are autistic, mm. who are articulate and can come on podcasts. That's for all autistic people, people with um, additional communication barriers, people with intellectual disability, people mm. with physical disability who are also autistic. It's yeah. about, and people who are marginalised, like First Nations people um, and people from migrant communities where the stigma mm. is even greater we need mm. to be understanding that it's not just people like me who are speaking on podcasts or working in jobs. Our responsibility as a society is to include and acknowledge and value every human being. Yeah, absolutely. We've all got a responsibility there. Now, I'm only going to get 60 seconds of this. We might have to mm-hmm. jump in at another time. Uh, so 60 seconds in regards to let's pretend it's 20 years into the future and we've achieved success in the disability sector. What does it look like? What does it feel like? Paint me a picture. Well, I've retired. <laughs> <laughs> what does it look uh, like for everyone else? <laughs> I think, no, I think, well, I've always said that if there's not a issue in the disability sector, I'll be off doing something else anyway. But, look, I think it looks like people having rich, full and meaningful lives supported mm. uh, through interdependent relationships that aren't just clinical and therapeutic and formal mm. and paid relationships, that they're, that people can live rich lives uh, integrated into that interdependence of society so that, so that, our lives just aren't ones full of formal therapeutic relationships or support workers, but that people notice, for example, when we're not there and they yeah. follow up. Uh, and, um, you know, I think that's really important that people in society recognise that it's a community responsibility and not somebody else's responsibility to enhance the lives of their fellow citizens and Mm. to notice when they're not there and when things seem to be going wrong and that it's actually okay to speak up about those issues and that's kind of what I'd like to see in the future is that interdependence and true kind of valuing of human beings as with disability as integral Mm. To the fabric of society, so that the diversity of hum- humanity is enriched by disabled mm. people, and that we are equal citizens. 
Oh, that's fantastic. Well, on that note, we do have to run. So thanks. That brings today's episode to an end. I hope you have found it educational for those listening and got something from it. As fellow Aussies, we know that there is nothing worse than being stingy. So if you have got value from this, please do feel free to share it with anyone who you think might benefit, whether that be a participant, support coordinator, or even a family member, anyone you think we can positively impact. Catherine, before we close off, how can people get in touch with yourself? Oh, goodness. What's the best way to get in touch with me? Um, I think that they can email info at a different mind.online. Perfect. We'll check that in yep. the show notes. As always, if you've got any feedback, please do get in touch with us via email and we'll have all the further information in the show notes. Uh, we will see you on the next episode. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>